Mary Ellen Beatty, director of the Citizen Watchdog Program, which is a special project of the Franklin Center. Well, yesterday we heard from Kate Obenshane and her new book, Divider in Chief. And today we're going to talk about another book authored by John Fund called Who's Counting? How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk. John Fund is one of the nation's leading experts on voter fraud, and his writing on the subject has appeared in several prominent news outlets. Previously, John was a columnist for the Wall Street Journal, and currently he writes for the National Review Online, and he's also senior editor of the American Spectator. John, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today. Wonderful. Well, before we get started and just jump into your book, I want to remind everyone who's watching that today's webinar is live and you can submit questions in real time. So if you have questions for Mr. Fund, please email me at maryellen.bd at franklincenterhq.org and that email is on the screen for you. Well, wonderful. Um, John, why don't you first start off by telling us why you decided to write this book? Well, I first started writing on this subject in earnest after the Florida recount of mm. Bush v. Gore in 2000, because that was a very sad chapter in our history. Definitely. We had 47 days of a constitutional crisis. Uh, lawyers and courts got involved uh, when I think the voters should have had the final say, and there were charges of both bureaucratic bungling and fraud. So I've always been concerned ever since then that we haven't done nearly as much as we should have to clean up our election systems. Mm -hmm. uh, Walter Dean Burnham, the nation's premier political scientist, says we have the sloppiest election systems of any industrialized democracy. Wow. Um, now, can you tell citizens who are watching right now, how can they get a hold of your book? If they're watching the program today and they decide um, that they want to order your book, where can they find it? Well, Amazon.com is a good place. Of course. They give a discount. <laughs> Uh, barnesandnoble.com and of course Better Bookstores and I think that uh, if they want a signed copy they can go to many of my events or they can write encounterbooks.com. Yes, and we've had you at several of our trainings for the Franklin sure. Center for our Citizen right. Watchdog trainings and I know you speak frequently with True the Vote which is a great organization. So. Yes, they're trying to get 300,000 volunteers to monitor the polling places, clean up absentee ballot applications and also look at the voter registration rolls. You know, we have such a sloppy system that the Pew Research Center, which is a nonpartisan research group, found we have 3.8 million people who are registered in more than one state. Wow. And everyone says, well, that would never be used. Well, it's actually fairly easy. You vote in person in one state, you vote absentee in another state mm. through the mail. And just last month, a Democratic congressional candidate in Maryland, Wendy Rosen, she was found to have voted in both Florida and Maryland at the same time, uh -huh. and that's illegal. And so she had to resign. Now, if a congressional nominee will do that, lots of other people might be tempted to do that. In addition, the Pew Research Center found one out of eight of our voter registrations are either invalid or contain major errors. That's an engraved invitation to voter fraud. Um, the dead, for example, if they're on the voter rolls, we have two million dead people, according to the Pew Research Center, on our voter registration rolls. And you know, if you vote in the name of a dead person, they're not likely to complain. <laughs> and look, I think we should honor our dead, but I do not believe that they should have representation without respiration. <laughs> Those are some frightening statistics. And, um, and you know, we have Eric Holder in the Justice Department who says that there, you know, we don't have a problem with voter fraud in this country. Would you, would you agree with that statement? Well, in April, I think that became preposterous for him to say that because James O'Keefe, the fellow who destroyed Acorn mm -hmm. with his videos and also humility of the NPR. He sent a 22-year-old assistant of his into Eric Holder's polling place in Washington. The fellow had a beard, he had an earring, he was white, and he <laughs> so walked up to... certainly didn't look like Eric exactly. Holder. Exactly. <laughs> he walked up to a table and said, um, "Can do you have an Eric Holder at Brookhaven Terrace? He didn't even say it was Eric Holder, and they handed him a ballot. Wow. Now, he didn't cast the ballot because that would have been a crime. He was there to test the system, not to subvert it. So they said, um, well, do you want to vote? And he said, well, I, don't you need to show ID? No, we don't ask for ID here. So he says, well, I really feel better getting my ID out and bringing it in and showing it to you. I'll go back to my car and get it. I'll be back faster than I can say furious. <laughs> but so it's really easy. We don't know how much voter impersonation fraud there is. We do know because there's a paper trail that's a lot of absentee ballot fraud. We don't know how much voter impersonation fraud there is because how would you detect it mm -hmm. without asking for an ID? 
it's almost the perfect crime unless you want to, unless someone confesses. Now that James O'Keefe incident was caught on video, um, which is very powerful, and so many times I think voter fraud ends up being anecdotes uh, and you have to track down the paper trail maybe, but what are some other examples, um, some solid examples of voter fraud that we can point to when people say, oh, there really is no such thing? Well, let's take Minnesota, the Senate race in 2008 that changed history. Al Franken, the uh, former comedian, social activist running against Norm Coleman, the Republican U.S. Senator. Uh, Coleman led on election night. He led in the first couple of recounts, but after lots of recounts and after some very controversial reinterpretations of ballot law that led some absentee ballots to be counted that hadn't previously been counted, Franken, after eight months of legal battles, was declared the victor by 312 votes. Well, he became the 60th vote for Obamacare. Um, Obamacare couldn't have passed unless it got 60 votes. You mm -hmm. did that to break a filibuster. So Al Franken brought us Obamacare in part. Well, after his election and after his vote in Obamacare, a watchdog group called Minnesota Majority, they found irrefutable proof that 1,100 felons had voted illegally in that election. Now, we can't be certain how the felons voted, but when Fox News interviewed a bunch of them, 9 out of 10 said they voted for Franken. When felons register by party in states that do allow that, and that's over 30 of them, um, they tend to register Democratic 75, 80 percent of the time. So voter fraud not only swung the election to Al Franken, without Al Franken's vote, we probably wouldn't have the current form of Obamacare. We'd have something different. Wow. Um, some shocking examples. So we hear things like this, and I think we're all appalled, and we, we worry about um, kind of the state of our election system. So is the election system broken in America right now? And, and if so, how do we fix it? It's loosey-goosey and sloppy. Mm -hmm. uh, some states do a very good job. Um, I think that Texas and Virginia have taken great strides in recent years to clean up their systems. Uh, Florida's trying to do that. Mm -hmm. S some states, though, they've tried to pass voter ID laws, for example. They've been blocked. Um, Pennsylvania is going to have a voter ID law, but it, the court case has dragged on so long they couldn't implement it in time for this election. Um, about I think 11 states currently have a photo ID law. There'll be six more uh, early next year that were delayed this year due to lawsuits. Uh, overall, I think 33 or 34 states require some form of identification at the polls. But in a whole bunch of states, including New York and Illinois and California, our three biggest states, mm -hmm. none of them require ID at the polls. Even though we require ID for almost everything else in life, from cashing a check, from going to see the doctor, from traveling, from getting a job, from getting a welfare benefit. You have to show an ID for all of those things, but not for voting. You know, I even have to show an ID to use the, the pool at my apartment complex. So you're right, we use it quite a bit. So then what is the, what is the controversy about, about you know, voter ID? Because you hear a lot that it's voter suppression, you know, if there's a state asking for ID at the polls. What's, what's the controversy? Well, the controversy is among political elites. It's not among the general public. Mm -hmm. The latest Washington Post poll on photo ID found 74% favor it. 65% of African Americans, 64% of Hispanics, 60% of Democrats. In fact, the only group were the one with just a plurality, 48 to 44, were self-described liberal progressives, uh, otherwise known as MSNBC viewers. And even they don't pay attention to MSNBC mm -hmm. because even they back photo ID. So then does voter ID, how does it affect turnout at the polls? Are, are there fewer people who vote with voter ID laws? Well. You'd think, if the liberal critics are correct, that a lot of fewer people would vote mm -hmm. because, for example, the Brennan Center at NYU th says we have 25% of African Americans who lack an ID. I think that's preposterous and patronizing to say that. Uh, in Indiana and Georgia, which have the toughest ID laws in the country, they've been in effect now for two federal elections, 2008 and 2010. Turnout went up. Turnout went up dramatically among minorities, and turnout went up not just in the year Barack Obama was on the ballot, but in 2010 when he wasn't on the ballot. So from those empirical data, we can presume that voter ID does not have a major effect, and all of the studies that have been taken, whether it's American University or University of Missouri, show no discernible effect. And if anything, um, the fact that people have more confidence in the integrity of the election, if they're asked to show ID, there might even be a slight increase in turnout. So are there any states that are a good model of voter ID laws or maybe just election reform in general? Are there any states that you can think of that would be um, a model for others? 
Well, all the states that have passed ID laws have also done, uh, recently, they've passed an absentee ballot reform law. Right now, it's very easy to commit fraud with an absentee ballot. So some states, starting with Kansas and moving on to Pennsylvania and other states, have said, well, if you're going to vote absentee, you either include a photocopy of your ID or you include the last five digits or your last of your social security number or your driver's license. And that will dramatically cut down on some forms of absentee ballot fraud. And lastly, we need to clean up the voter registration rolls. You know, the one out of eight registrations that I said were either invalid or contained major errors. I think we need to amend the motor voter law. This is a federal law that passed in the 1990s that said states had to wait many years before cleaning up their voter rolls after someone stopped voting. I think we have to have a much cleaner voter registration list, both to prevent fraud but to prevent confusion. And frankly, there's no excuse for not having a good, clean list. Um, we have a citizen who just wrote in and has a question. What is presently being done to stop the possibility of voter fraud for this election? And furthermore, are both sides involved in illegal fraud? I think that's an interesting question. Well, of course, neither party has a monopoly on virtue. Mm -hmm. Political power is very tempting. There's enormous ability to direct resources from your enemies to your friends. In politics, people are often tempted to cheat in order to get that power. There used to be a lot more Republican voter fraud. Uh, there were big cities used to have machines that were run by Republicans. Al Capone's protector in Chicago was a Republican mayor. Mm. Uh, there was a Republican machine in Philadelphia. There was a Republican machine in Long Island, New York. But those machines have all collapsed, and they've now been replaced by either no machine at all that has the power to conduct fraud on an organized basis, or they've been replaced by Democratic machines that just picked up where the Republicans left off and have perfected voter fraud. You know, in the 1980s, the Justice Department found a conspiracy in the city of Chicago. They estimated 100,000 people voted twice or voted illegally in one election that was won by 5,000 votes. So Chicago has a notorious reputation for voter fraud, but lots of other places do too. Detroit, Philadelphia. Definitely. Um, you had mentioned keeping the voter lists clean, that that's very important for prevention. Is there anything that citizens can do to, to help keep the voter list clean? Uh, or, or is there anything a citizen can do to help uh, with prevention? Because I know we're talking well, prevention's key in this well, case. You have to have prevention because we have a secret ballot. If somebody votes fraudulently and their vote goes into the general pile of votes, you, there's no way you can take it back. Mm. You have to prevent it effectively, unless it's an absentee ballot, and even there it's very difficult to get that rejected after the fact. So I think what we need to have is a lot more citizen volunteers, okay. uh, people who pour through the voter registration list and just flag potential problems, people who examine the absentee ballot situation, and who show up at the polls, because you know vote fraud is a lot like shoplifting. If you take no precautions against shoplifting as a store owner, you're going to get robbed a lot. If you put up signs that say violators will be prosecuted, you put up cameras, you instruct your employees on basic security measures, you can reduce shoplifting 30 to 40 percent just by those kind of deterrent measures. I think the same is true of voter fraud. So what about uh, absentee voting and also early voting? Um, are they more susceptible to voter fraud than maybe voting on election day? There's a distinction between absentee and early voting. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've let absentee voting get out of hand. It used to be for people who were bedridden or people who were going to be out of town on business. Okay. Um, I think we should have absentee votes, but I don't think that they should go to 20, 25 percent of the population, which is what's happening in places like California. Oregon and Washington have abolished the polling place. You can only vote by mail now. I think that's sad. Because for one thing, it stretches out the campaign uh, process by which people try to get out the vote to 40 days rather than one. You know, our Constitution talks about election day. It doesn't talk about election month. And I also think there are real problems of people voting before the debates. You know, 85% of the American people could have voted early before the last debate that we had this week. That's sad because it's sort of, imagine you were suing someone in a jury trial for thousands of dollars. And as soon as your lawyer gets up to make a summation argument for you, three jurors get up and say, I've heard enough, I'm voting and leaving. How would you feel? Mm. At, so early voting has those kind of problems, but it's less susceptible to fraud than most kinds of voting because it's done in the government si mm -hmm. supervised situation. Uh, absentee voting, lots of problems. We've had mayors in Indiana and Florida had their, and, and 
city state legislators in Philadelphia thrown, had their elections thrown out by judges who have found massive absentee ballot fraud. Um, it's the fraudster's tool of choice because you cast it when it's out in the community and there's no effective constraint or control over it. Now, if citizens are more interested about their state election law or, for example, the state of the voter rolls um, where they live, is that public information? Can they, you know, perhaps a make an open records request? A remarkable number of things are public information. <laughs> uh, in fact, sometimes they can be misused. Um, in California recently, a few years ago, um, there's a group of permanent absentee voters, people who always get an absentee ballot. Okay. And what some enterprising person did, they got a hold of the absentee permanent voters for one party. And it's a very close race, so what they did is they filled out a new registration card for all of these voters. And they sent it in. Well, all the information on the card was the same except for the signature, which was an illegible scrawl rather than the real signature. So these people were sent absentee ballots to the address that was on the new form, mm -hmm. which was their address. They voted, they sent it back in. But the temporary clerk looking at the ballots said, well, these signatures don't even match. They don't even come close. So their ballots were thrown out. Something like 200 ballots were thrown out that way. The election was decided by a little over 100 votes. That election was stolen. By subtracting votes from the candidate you didn't want to win, probably by someone we don't know who was working for the candidate who did win. Wow, so these are some really clear examples. Um, so then why do we always hear so much about voter suppression tactics? I think we hear that a lot in the media, voter suppression. If you're just trying to push for an honest election, um, then, then why is that seen as suppression well, the argument, tactic? The argument is that, again, 25% of African Americans, 10% of the general population lack an ID. Those are disproportionately poor and elderly people, and therefore you're disenfranchising minorities and the less fortunate of us. But again, voter ID laws have not reduced turnout. They've not reduced minority turnout. Uh, They've not led to major problems. Uh, studies have shown that 99.5% of people have effective photo ID, and it's very easy and free to get one in the states that have passed a photo ID law. So I think it's crying wolf when there's not even any sheep in the field. And it's ridiculous. But I have to say there are some people who believe that anything you do, anything you do to attach a responsibility to the right to vote is somehow illegitimate or wrong. And I just don't see that. You know, again, the polls show an overwhelming number of Americans believe voter fraud is a serious or somewhat serious problem. Under Scott Rasmussen's latest poll, it was 66 percent. So I think there's a big gulf between the liberal critics of these kind of laws and the general population. So, John, what are your predictions for the 2012 election? You know, we hear these examples and, you know, obviously we're concerned. Um, what are your, your hopes or predictions then for this upcoming election? Well, my hope is that it isn't close because I don't want to avoid a Florida-style meltdown mm. where we have a go to recounts in not just one state but several states. I also want to avoid, you know, the constitutional issues that will be raised and judges and lawyers getting involved where they shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. um, I think this election is going to be very, very close. And if we have recounts, the sad part is the winning candidate may have to win not just with a margin of victory, but with a margin beyond litigation because there'll be so many lawsuits lodged. So important to get involved this election season, like you said, you Absolutely. know, volunteer and make an open records request and find out. Make sure you know your state election laws. It's very, very important. Um, what about the military? I do want to shift uh, and talk about that. The last debate was on foreign policy, so a lot, a lot of thoughts on the military lately. And you know, my husband is in the Army Engineer Corps. He was, you know, served in Afghanistan. Just got home a few weeks ago. Was he able to vote when he was overseas? Um, well, see, he he's back now. Um, but was he? Did he vote in 2010, or was he overseas then? He wasn't overseas okay, then, gotcha. but um, but it is a concern, you know. Well, it's, something like only 30 percent of the ballots we send out as absentee ballots to our overseas military come back as actual votes. Now, some of that is because people decide they don't want to vote after mm -hmm. all, but a lot of it is because they're, not, they're just delayed. Um, it, you have, they're supposed to get the ballot 45 days in advance. They don't. Uh, they're supposed to mail it back with enough time to get it counted. Often they don't have enough time or the delivery is too slow. And I think that this kind of disenfranchisement, which is what it is, is very unfortunate because these are the very people who are trying to protect our freedoms and fight for our freedoms and they're being denied one of the most basic of their 
of their freedoms, which is the right to vote. Um, we have a citizen who just wrote in and said, um, oftentimes poll workers are often so old that they don't seem to know the rules. You know, how can we, how can we fix that? Is, do you think that that's a problem that maybe people who are volunteering and working the polls aren't fully informed about the rules? We have a very brave and a very loyal group of poll workers, but many of them are over the age of 70, and mm -hmm. they're not the most technologically savvy or the most up-to-date on some of the new election procedures. I think we need a more diverse poll watcher, poll worker population. One way to do that would be, let's give high school and college kids who often aren't studying civics anymore like we did, let's give them credit if they s sign up at the polls as a poll walker Poll, I'm sorry, a poll watcher or a poll monitor, and let's give them the experience and a taste of democracy, and that would also inject, I think, a lot of needed new energy into the process, and these kids, of course, know exactly how computers and electronic voting machines mm. work. Yeah, that's a great point, maybe just getting younger give credit, people involved. Give them credit, sure. <laughs> Do you have any other recommendations on maybe how to get young people involved in the process? Well, I think... Young people are often cynical, mm -hmm. and what we found is uh, people are very cynical about the honesty of the election. Something like over 40% of the people have serious doubts that their vote is going to be counted accurately and fairly, and that includes young people. So by cleaning up the integrity and the honesty of our elections and minimizing bureaucratic bungling and voter fraud, we make the system more popular and much more of the population confident that it actually represents the will of the majority. So one of the ways to get everybody more involved is demonstrating that we have a system that works and actually counts their votes accurately. Now, John, I want to switch gears a little bit and ask you, I know you've mentioned at previous lectures and presentations that our president has a relationship with the organization ACORN, and I was hoping that you could uh, elaborate a little bit on that and tell us about uh, his yeah. relationship there. Well, it's the organization formerly known as ACORN because it has gone bankrupt. Uh, some of its organizers are trying to form under new names and under new mismanagement. Um, ACORN, you know, was a notorious voter registration fraud mill. Uh, something like 40% of the 1.4 million registrations they turned in in 2008 were fraudulent. Um, they finally got caught on an unrelated subject regarding uh, giving advice to, to a James O'Keefe uh, f um, who was pl playing a uh, part of a pimp, giving him advice on how to set up a house of prostitution. So that destroyed the organization's credibility. But long before ACORN got into that kind of trouble, ACORN had friends in high places. Barack Obama was ACORN's lawyer mm -hmm. in a key civil rights case involving whether or not the motor voter law, which helped bring us all of these registration lists that we can't seem to call and reduce the, the improper number of names on them. Uh, Barack Obama was the top trainer for ACORN in Chicago. He was their top voter registration director for Project Vote, which is an arm of ACORN. So Barack uh, Barack Obama is very much part of ACORN. And sadly, I think the culture in ACORN, which still exists in some organizations and cities today, is not one conducive to free and honest and fair elections. Wow. Well, thank you, John. Uh, I just want to remind everybody that if you have questions for Mr. John Fund, feel free to email me at maryellen.bd at franklincenterhq.org. Um, I'm going to do another citizen sure. question here. Everybody, uh, thanks so much for sending in your questions today. Why don't conservatives do more to push for voter reform? I think a large part of it is they didn't realize it was a problem. Uh, they've been told by over and over again, oh, this is something Mayor Daley did in Chicago 50 years ago, or this is something that is a thing of the past. So there's that, but there's also the fact that any time you approach an issue of voting reform, you're going to be called a racist. You're going to be called someone who's trying to suppress the minority vote. Ironically, former Congressman Arthur Davis, a Democrat from Alabama, who seconded Barack Obama's nomination for president at the Denver Democratic Convention, he has changed sides. He has said, look, I no longer could defend um, opposing voter laws voter ID laws, because I know there's corruption and fraud in my own district in Alabama. There have been places like Greene County where elections have been stolen. Some of the biggest victims, he says, of voter fraud are minority residents in areas controlled by political machines who try to reform the system, and they find they can't fight City Hall because City Hall keeps stealing the election out from under them. 
So I think far from being discriminatory against minorities, there are places where minorities would benefit greatly from having election reform and things like photo ID laws because it would make it less likely the machine could steal the election from them and continue to deliver a bad deal for their tax dollars. John, we have someone who's asking about a news story that I believe just came out this week about the United Nations um, potentially watching our elections um, this season in 2012. Were you familiar with that? Yeah, and it's a little bit exaggerated. It's not so much the UN, it's the Organization for Cooperation and Security in okay. Europe. Uh, it is affiliated with the UN, but it's not a formal UN organization. You know, they came in 2010 to observe our election system, and they basically said they did not perceive the kind of voter suppression and voter intimidation they had been warned about and was predicted to happen in that election. So I don't think they have any jurisdiction here. I don't think that they have any right to do anything more than observe. But look, we're a free and open society. I'm happy to have investigators and observers. We send out observer teams to countries all over the world. And frankly, some of those countries have better election systems than we do. And we could learn from people who came here to observe our elections. And we could learn from their best practices and clean up our own election systems. Um, now we have someone talking about um, how there are a few states that want to pre-register um, minors to vote when they turn 16, when they go in to get their driver's license. What are your thoughts on, on that tactic? And why would they want to do that? I mean, what's the point? They can't vote yet. Mm. Um, first of all, if you pre-register someone, there's always the danger that they could go and vote. You know, a clerk could, look, you can, you can easily vote this illegally. Why make it even more tr possible for someone to get confused? You know, if you register someone to vote, a certain percentage of people will think, I can vote now. You know, we had 430 people in Colorado after there was a discussion about how many non-citizens were on the voter registration rolls. 430 people wrote into the Secretary of State, Scott Gessler, and said, you know, somehow at the driver's license or the unemployment bureau or something, somebody handed me this registration card and I filled it out, and now I learn that I wasn't supposed to because I'm not a citizen. Please take my name off the list. Now, if 430 people will spontaneously do that in a state like Colorado, there must be thousands of non-citizens on the voter rolls. And we would know that, except that Bush, uh, the Obama Department of Justice and the Department of Homeland Security are very leery of handing over their lists of non-citizens to states so they can check them with their voter registration mm -hmm. rolls and find out who's on the list and who shouldn't be on the list. So I don't think we want to... I don't see any advantage in doing that. They can register when they turn 18. So we talked about our young voters are maybe too young to vote. What about our older voters, you know, senior citizens who may be in the nursing home or who are immobile, um, but they're getting maybe absentee ballots in the mail? Are there well, any statistics about... I'm glad about you have absentee ballots for those folks, but they can be misused. Uh, a few years ago, a former congressman from Pennsylvania, a congressman, was convicted of going into Alzheimer's disease homes and helping people fill out their ballots, shall we say, over-enthusiastically. And he was convicted of basically stealing votes. And if a former congressman will do that, almost anyone will do that. Mm -hmm. So Pennsylvania cleaned up that system. They require that if you're in a nursing home and you want to vote absentee, it happens on one day, and teams from both parties show up and monitor the process and make sure it's fine. Mm -hmm. And if you need to vote outside of that window, they can make a special arrangement, but it means that somebody is watching at every bed when the vote is being cast. Now, John, do you have any maybe shocking stories for us? Or if there are people, friends of ours, or maybe citizens who are watching who are still unsure about voter fraud or the state of election integrity in America, do you have maybe any key talking points or key stories that they can tell um, to help convince others? Well, we have an extremely poor system. Um, We've had elections in Indiana and Florida and Philadelphia thrown up by federal courts because of the amount of fraud. Uh, we've had a situation where Bill Clinton you know, mounted the podium at the Democratic National Convention in Charlotte, and he claimed, look, this is a solution in search of a problem. There is no voter fraud. But you know, that very day that Bill Clinton made that speech, that very day in Arkansas where he used to be governor and he used to be attorney general, a Democratic state legislator, a city councilman in West Memphis, and a police official in West Memphis were all convicted on 45 counts of voter fraud. And it was an election that was decided by eight votes, so it actually swung the election. Uh, 
Bill Clinton is willfully ignoring what was happening in his own backyard as he was making that statement. So all you have to do is go to, there's a website called rnla.org. It's run by the Republican National Lawyers Association. Just go there and you will see issue after issue after issues of voter fraud happening in this country as we speak mm -hmm. and not enough is being done to stop it. Mm -hmm. Luckily there are groups out there like truthevote.org mm -hmm. that are helping out trying to get volunteers to make sure the process runs more smoothly. So I hope everyone gets involved because the vote fraud deniers are wrong. People are stealing elections and they steal elections even more when it's perceived to be close. This election is going to be very, very close. So unlike 2008, where there was much less pressure because it was a big gap at the end of the last you know, polls between the two candidates, I think this election is going to go right down to the wire and the temptation to put a th thumb on the scale of democracy and press down will be very, very high. Yeah. You're right about that. I think it will be close. So. I've got another citizen question here. Is there anything that legislators can do to make voter reform more palatable and not be accused of being racist? For example, maybe jurisdictions offering free or low-cost photo IDs to lower-income families. Well, they do, they do that to everyone. Everyone gets a free ID. Georgia sent out mobile vans to try to uh, go to places where they might find people who needed a photo ID. They didn't find many. South Carolina had offered free rides to the local DMV office to get your free ID to people. In the last year, they've had 23 requests, which is not a whole lot in a state that has you know, something approaching 5 million people. Um, Pennsylvania went so far as to say, um, if you forget your ID at the polls, even though you have one, you vote a provisional ballot, and all you have to do is email or fax or snail mail or walk in person with evidence that you have an ID and they will count your vote. And if there, are, there were few people who don't even have the money to get a copy of their birth certificate so they can get a free ID, mm. Pennsylvania had a provision that if you signed an affidavit attesting that, that you are, are who you say you are, your vote would still be counted even without an ID. So there are all kinds of provisions that can be made, but you know, none of these provisions prevent the lawsuits that are launched. People just oppose photo ID even though one of the states that passed photo ID was Rhode Island, which has a legislature that's eight to one Democratic, uh, a liberal independent governor who signed it into law. And Rhode Island, the sponsor of the bill in the House was the African-American Speaker of the House. The sponsor of the bill in the State Senate was the only African-American State Senator. And I interviewed both of them and they said, look, we're from Providence, Rhode Island. There is fraud going on in our neighborhoods and we would ask our constituents to stop it. And this is a reasonable approach. Uh, another question, why has voter ID issue become so partisan? Shouldn't both Democrats and Republicans support voter ID? Well, it didn't used to be this partisan. You know, in 2002, we had the Help America Vote Act, which mm -hmm. was in response to the Florida meltdown. And it was bipartisan. Senators Kit Bond, a Republican of Missouri, Senator Chris Dodd, a Democrat of Connecticut. Senator Dodd at the time said this bill is something that we all should support because it does two things. It makes it easy to vote and it makes it hard to cheat. We can do both, and I agree. 2005, there was a presidential commission on studying all of our election systems. They issued 87 separate recommendations, the most important one of which was national photo ID. Mm -hmm. Now, that commission was co-chaired by former President Jimmy Carter, who, as you know, has a lot of experience in monitoring elections around the world. And I have to tell you, Jimmy Carter was a Democrat, a very respected Democrat, he brought most of the Democrats on his commission along to his side. There were 21 members of the commission, 10 Democrats, 10 Republicans, one independent. The final vote in favor of photo ID was 18 to 3. So it passed with a big bipartisan majority. It's only been the last few years where I think these, this has been polarized. But again, it's not polarized in the general population. They all support photo ID. It's polarized just among the political elites and frankly, a bunch of people I think who I mean, I can only interpret some of their opposition to be either deluded or they're giving cover to political machines that have a long tradition of shenanigans at the polls. Um, what do you think our, our founding fathers might have to say about some of these election reform laws or about um, voter fraud happening in America today? Well, we had a rough and woolly history. You know, George <laughs> Washington gave out free booze to people in order to help to convince them to vote. You know, that would be illegal today, so it was a different time. <laughs> mm -hmm. But certainly, our founding fathers were concerned about voter fraud. Um, 
it was one of the reasons why they limited the franchise, because they thought that there was so much fraud that elections would be manipulated on a, on a routine basis. But about 120 years ago, we started having election reforms. We, we developed the secret ballot. Uh, we developed uh, ballots that were printed by the state, not by the individual parties. Uh, we had privacy booths set up so people could vote without someone looking over their shoulder. We need to preserve those gains and we need to add to that something which makes sense now. We can no longer have an honor system when it comes to voting. Mm. We have to ask people for an ID. Look, Reagan said trust but verify. That's what I say on voting. We should trust people to want to vote and to vote responsibly, but we want to verify their information. So how can we push for some of these election reforms or maybe even just talk to our friends and neighbors without being called a racist? Well, I'll be honest with you. You're going to be called a racist no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. um, doing nothing is not an option. Uh, I think it's become a tired, old cliché. It detracts from real racism, which we all should oppose mm -hmm. and denounce. And I just have to say we look at the evidence. The evidence is 65% of African Americans and 64% of Hispanics support photo ID. Um, Democrats in states like Kansas and in New Hampshire and in Rhode Island have been in favor of this concept. Um, there are some prominent Democrats who have supported it. Uh, we have former Congressman Arthur Davis who has said, mm -hmm. look, I used to oppose them. Now I think it's necessary because the real voter suppression that's going on is not people being blocked from voting at the polls. The real voter suppression is when people have their vote canceled out because somebody's voting in their name or they're voting twice, or they're voting as a non-citizen, or they're voting as someone who's dead. And that cancels out people's legitimate votes. That can be disenfranchised people just as much as if you block someone from entering a polling place by saying you can't come in here. So are there more efforts in 2012? Obviously, there's been a lot of awareness, I'd say, in the last six months for sure, the last year for sure, about voter fraud and how to prevent it. Um, are there other things being done in the 2012 election? Or is there an attempt to maybe collect stories and anecdotes of voter fraud or well, maybe lawyers we, on hand? We, yeah, well, we have 10,000 lawyers. That's going to be one of the problems. Oh, wow. we, have lots, <laughs> we have too many people watching this election because of concerns about bureaucratic bundling, like the infamous Palm Beach ballot that messed up the 2000 election in Florida, oh, wow. but also voter fraud. And, you know, there are, there are cases of voter intimidation. And those should be discovered and found out and prevented. But I have to say... Um, what we need is to act before the election. After the election, it's too late because almost all of these ballots go into the general pool mm -hmm. and you can't pluck them out. So what we need to deter is we have to tell people this is a felony. You can be prosecuted for it. You will be prosecuted if you're caught. And we need to look, have people bird dog the voter registration rolls, figure out wh where some of the problem areas are. You know, we have 160 counties in this country including some of the largest, where there are more people registered to vote than there are adults over the age of 18, according to the Census Bureau. That's a clue that there could be mischief on Election Day. Definitely. Well, John, thank you so much for thank joining you. us today. Really appreciate it. I hope all of you will go and, uh, and purchase John's book, Who's Counting? How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats um, Put Your Vote at Risk. And I would also mention my co-author is Hans von Spakowski, who's a former member of the Federal Election Commission and now with the Heritage Foundation. Wonderful. Great. Well, again, thank you so thank much. You. Mm -hmm. And we hope that you'll join us tomorrow. Um, we have townhall.com's Be Guy Benson. He'll be coming in to talk to you about some of the key state races. Of course, we all know what's happening in the federal election, right? But he's going to tell you about what are some of those key state races to be looking at as well. Wonderful. Thanks so much. We'll see you tomorrow. Great. Conservativejobs.com exists to connect conservative job seekers with potential employers. The site is completely free to use and on it, job seekers can create professional profiles, upload their resumes and review hundreds of job openings posted by employers. On the other end, employers can create recruiter profiles, post job listings, search through hundreds of profiles and contact the job seekers directly. We like to say that we're matching great job seekers with great jobs. The Conservative Job and Internship Fair at CPAC is a great event that allows hundreds of job seekers to meet and network with recruiters from many different conservative organizations in one place. 
The goal is to provide a forum for them to discuss job openings, qualifications, and interests. It's like a first interview without all the pressure. Our mission is to help students and professionals find their dream jobs.